I'm Raymond Massey, and I have a special message for senior citizens. Today's doctors, drugs, and medical devices truly work medical miracles for young and old alike. But there are some as phony as a $3 bill. Like this Zeret applicator, for example, which has claimed to cure arthritis with Z-rays. There are no Z-rays. Investigate before you invest in health services or products. Help stamp out quackery. Welcome to the United States of Addiction. We want everything big, we want everything now, and we don't want to work for it. In 2008, I made my first film, Bigger, Stronger, Faster, about my heroes and their dirty little secret, steroids. I mean, steroids were for cheaters and losers, and worse yet, they kill you, right? Well, actually, no. It turns out they won't kill you. But what I didn't know then was that there was another skeleton in the closet that was hidden from view. A real danger lying beneath the surface, like jaws waiting to strike. The actor Heath Ledger was found dead today in an apartment here in New York City. Pop superstar Michael Jackson is dead at the age of 50. Suddenly, my heroes started to die. Lots of them. But it wasn't from steroids. It was from drugs. The full extent of Michael Jackson's dependence on prescription drugs is splashed across today's front pages. And not the illegal kind like you would expect. We haven't lost someone to heroin in a while. We've concluded that the manner of death is accident, resulting from the abuse of prescription medications. People were dying from prescription drugs. Prescription drug abuse is killing more people in this country than car wrecks. Legal drugs, the kinds the doctors give us. You know, the kindly old doctor that used to be by your bedside when you had the mumps and gave you all your flu shots? The good guy, the one looking out for our health. Prosecutors say you didn't need an appointment. All you had to do was send the doctor a text message and open your wallet. But these days, the doctors are starting to look more like drug dealers. Dr. Verbovsky orchestrated a scheme to trade prescriptions for pills in exchange for sexual favors and money. And if they're the dealers, what does that make us? The junkies? Today, a widespread fondness for pharmaceuticals has turned the U.S. into a nation of pill poppers. How many people in this bitch pop pills? We only represent 5% of the world's population, yet we consume 75% of the world's prescription drugs. We got no business popping as many pills as we do. According to the federal government, last year more than 6 million Americans used OxyContin for recreational purposes. In 2010, 254 million prescriptions for opioids were filled in this country. That's enough painkillers to medicate every American adult around the clock for a month. I had, I had never experienced the kind of euphoria that I got from a pain pill. We have drugs for everything. Hell, we even have drugs for things that aren't even diseases. The first and only FDA approved prescription treatment for inadequate or not enough lashes. So how did we get this way? Talk to your doctor. Ask your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Ask your doctor. Just talk to your doctor. Every night on TV, you see a weird ass drug commercial trying to get you hooked on some legal shit. And they just keep naming symptoms till they get one that you fucking got, okay? It's like, are you sad? Are you lonely? You got an athlete's foot? Are you hot? Are you cold? What you got? You want this pill, huh, motherfucker? You got to take this pill. Ask yourself, is it really a war on drugs? Or are we just a nation of prescription thugs? Growing up in Poughkeepsie, New York, my brothers and I never even saw drugs. My parents were kind of nerds. They didn't even drink. We practically grew up in church. Our parents always taught us right from wrong. We knew drugs were bad, so we got into sports. From an early age, my big brother Mad Dog was my hero. We always knew he was destined for greatness. So when he told us he was going to wrestle for the WWE like our heroes, the Hulkster and the Warrior, we'd believe he'd finally made it. The sky was the limit for the Bell Brothers, and Mad Dog was leading the charge. But like most things in life, the reality of the situation wasn't that easy. You see, he never really got the big contract. He wasn't ever allowed to win. He was more like a carny traveling alongside the circus. He was feeder material, a jobber. 
Like most wrestlers, Mad Dog was thrown out of the ring and injured, and quickly found himself in the jaws of a serious addiction to Vicodin and other pain meds. His wrestling career took a dive, and Mad Dog never quite recovered from it. It was his worst fear, to be average, a nobody. Since Bigger, Stronger, Faster, Mad Dog has been in and out of rehab, wrestling with a major addiction to prescription pills. He's decided that he's had enough, so my father's flying out to California to see if he can help. Hey, how you doing? Hi guys, still locked, good. What, what's been going on with you, though, that you had to have him come out here? What, like, what's, what in general has been going on? Drugs or? Uh, no, not drugs. Uh, no I, drugs I, at all? No. I, 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 Honestly? I, I, I came out because uh, Mike asked me to come out, <clears throat> try to help him out. I, I don't know how long he can keep going like this. He was the one that told me on camera all the shit you were doing. I had no idea. Yeah. And I was, like, shaken when I'm interviewing. I'm like, yeah. what? Why didn't, why didn't he tell me that? He yeah. tells me everything. Usually people do drugs, like they'll just hide it and hide it and hide it. And he's like, not with me. He's like, I, I don't know. Oh, well, the, the problem is that I can hide it for too long of a time. I can hide it for, depending on the deal, depending on what the addiction is, I can hide it for three to six months. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then that's when things start going out of control again. I've already kind of prepared myself for that phone call that Mike is dead someplace, you know? And um, I mean, I've done all the crying. I've, I've had all the feelings. I've been through all the emotions and things like that. And that doesn't mean that when it happens, or if it happens, that I'm not going to be sad. It just means that I uh, have done everything mm -hmm. that I can, and I'm still doing everything that I can. Okay. Well, he'll, he'll break down, and he'll be crying, and he'll say, like, you know, Dad, the biggest fear I ever had in my life is being an average guy. But you have to be average before you can be any better. It's like you have to crawl before you can walk, and you have to walk before you can run. And he's stuck. You know, he's stuck right there. Mad Dog believes his addictions were fueled by his lack of success. But the closer he got to the spotlight, the bigger his problems became. <laughs> when I looked my best, I was on before I use a growth hormone a day, was on Cytomel every day, was on Sustanon two or three times a week, was on Winstrol every day, was on Ephedra every day, was on Clenbuterol every day, and was taking painkillers to get rid of the pain in my neck. When you wrestled for WWE, I mean, that's part of like not being the average Joe. Like you were on tour, you were on TV. I used to turn on at college and get all my friends around the TV, like, ah, oh, that's my brother, and we were so proud. Like, it's a high being in front of 20,000 people and getting a reaction. You know, I wasn't in front of 20,000 people too often, but I was in front of 20,000 people a few times. You walk out and you're, and you're like ready to kick ass and, and everybody starts cheering for you and it feels great. Uh -huh. And then you don't have that anymore. And you're just getting up and going to work, eating, sleeping, working, eating, sleeping, working, eating, sleeping, working. One of my biggest problems is I don't know what my dream is anymore. My dream when I was a kid was either to be some kind of pro athlete. Now it's that uh, I just don't know. I, that's part of my, that's a huge part of my problem is I don't know where to focus my energy. And I got a family that loves me with all their heart. And I got two brothers that are my best friends. I got a father that's my best friend. Mm -hmm. and I got a mother that loves me with all her heart. And I hurt you guys all the time. Yeah. You know, because I do stupid things. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to realize that you guys are much more important than ever making it in any sport or anything else. Mm -hmm. How could we never realize it before? Because I was blinded by my own bullshit. Mike um, has been close to so many goals so many times, and uh, then he'll set something else up as a goal and try to attain that, um, but never quite makes it, but never actually has any happiness in doing what he's doing. He had a big contract. If he was doing what he thinks he wanted to do, had the adulation of the crowd all the time, he'd be the guy that's always in trouble. He'd be the he'd be the people that are always blowing it. He'd be the he'd be the one that would be in and out of rehab and that the newspapers were following around. But if I got a contract when I was anywhere between 21 and 35, even I'm 36 now. If I got a, if I got a contract in that 15 years that I was wrestling, I would definitely be another dead wrestler. Absolutely, positively, 100 percent.
It was like 8 o'clock at night, our time, and uh, we got the call. When I heard Daddy say, no, 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 and uh, so I said, oh, don't tell me. I thought that after 62 days that Mike went off the way. I never That's what she thought ever thought was. that Daddy that was bad. And Daddy grabbed worse. me and he said, Michael died and I hit I still Yeah, it was a shock. The first thing I remember when she said that he was dead was what I said. Um, in the movie that I think they're going to find him dead someday because barring a miracle, there was no way out for him. After another relapse, Mad Dog crawled up the stairs of a sober living facility and was barely even able to knock on the door. A month later, he was sober. Two months later, he was dead. It was so cool. This is at Sundance. This was like one of his proudest moments. This is him right here. He's in this box. I didn't understand how this could happen to my brother. We were the all-American family. Where did we go wrong? Yeah. It was time I talked to my younger brother, Smelly. Maybe he can help me get some answers. Um, it, was, uh, it was on a uh, Sunday. I talked to Mike on Friday. He was saying, you know, how he hates being sick. He told me a time in his life when he felt the best mentally. And it was a time that he was in jail and he wasn't on anything. And that was the only time that he said he felt somewhat normal as an adult. Uh, Mad Dog's um, battle wasn't uh, necessarily just with prescription drugs. I think his battle was more with himself. I come from a family where I am in my family the fixer. Who's having a problem? I have to fix it. Here, here's some food. Food can fix it. You know, here, Mike, here, Chris, here, Mark. And food can fix it, or I can fix it, or we can fix it. Now this little boy that you were trying to fix is now taking drugs. After we lost Mike, I felt some solace and comfort in the fact that you and Mark had not done drugs. For me, I think, uh, you know, lifting has always kept me on a certain path. You don't even, like, ever drink or anything. You have, like, really no addictive behavior in that way, right? I won't take Advil. I won't take aspirin. I do think that people need to toughen up. I don't think that uh, everyone is in such severe pain that they, uh, they always need a drug. Living day-to-day -day life and dealing with day-to-day uh, -day stuff is, <laughs> isn't fun. It's not where it's at. You want to be in an altered state. And I think, uh, I think that was a big thing that Mike dealt with. He didn't want to deal with reality. Mad Dog always said, I'd rather be dead than average. It was part of his bigger than life persona. How did he let drugs take that away from him? Was my brother's death just another sad junkie story? Or were there other forces at work that pushed him into it? I had to find out. Mad Dog's addictions began in wrestling. If I was gonna understand, I needed to start with the people that knew him best. Ryan Sakota was one of Mad Dog's best pupils before becoming a superstar for the WWE and in Japan. I never did prescription drugs uh, until I got to WWE. And the only reason why I did them was because I, I wanted to keep my job. Like, when did you take your first painkiller? Like, from a doctor? Was from a doctor? No. Hey, <laughs> I actually got it from a friend. Another wrestler? Another wrestler. Because that wrestler yeah. was also a doctor? <laughs> no, no, but he was, he's a good friend. This is my friend Horseshoe. He was one of the baddest son of a bitches in the WWE. <laughs> I love dogs, man. Unlike Mad Dog, Horseshoe won most of his battles in the ring, but his battle outside the ring nearly cost him his life. You gotta get rid of the Red Bull, buddy. Why? And the cigarette. Why? Because we're gonna interview you. We can't be sitting there with a Red Bull and a cigarette. You can't interview until, until I finish smoking. <laughs> well, then finish smoking. I signed the contract with WCW right out of college, and then the money started rolling in, and then the pills came in because I was on the road every day. You know, it's like to graduate to that next level, you have to do certain things that a lot of people aren't willing to do. How many pills a day were you doing? 90. Five pills used to be enough for the day. You know what I mean? Now it wasn't enough, so I had to up it to 10. 10 pills eventually wasn't enough, so I up to 20. 20 wasn't. I used to take 10 at a time when I was doing 90 a day. I remember my girlfriend, she would lay out, you know, five Vicodin, you know, three Somas, 
um, two Viagras, two Cialis, you know, all my vitamins and minerals, and it was just, it was like a smorgasbord, you know what I mean? But I did that every day, that was normal. Viagra and Cialis in the morning? Yep, just so I was ready. Yep. <laughs> just in case. Yep, just in case. Did it ever occur to you like, hey look, I got a problem, I need to stop right now? No, I never really worried about it, you know? Listen, I thought I was invincible. What the fuck are pills gonna do to me? You know what I mean? You know, I, I never thought about, I never thought about dying, you know what I mean? They found me floating in the pool. So you like blacked out while you were swimming or something? Swimming. So I was floating and apparently someone jumped in and said, wake up in the ambulance. You know, uh, tubes up my nose, I got shit in my arms and I'm, I wake up and there was just, all I could see was just this light. You would think after something like that, that that would be it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but no. December 28th of uh, 2009 was the last time I did pills because that's the day I had a stroke. I didn't even know I had a stroke because I had it in my sleep and I was on so many Oxycontins and Vicodin and Soma, you know what I mean? You could have you shot me, I wouldn't have felt it. Look, when I was laying there on, on, on the sofa, I was laying there for two days. They said, he's not gonna make it through the night. Need to call his mother, get her out here so she can say her goodbyes, you know what I mean? I didn't go through one minute withdrawals. And what they found out, they did a CAT scan on my brain later. The CAT scan showed that the part of my brain that was killed was the part that harbored the addictions. And then you had to relearn everything, right? I had, had to look, relearn, relearn everything. How to, write, how, to how to write, how to read, how to walk. But now you're back smoking again, and yep. drinking Red Bulls again. Yep. Do you think you have, like, still have an addictive personality? Oh, I'll, uh, listen, there's no doubt. I'm an addict. That's for sure. You know what I mean? I'll be an addict till the day I die. Aspired to be a wrestler, never aspired to be a drug addict. That's what my brother used to say. And I, I, I'm actually ashamed to, to admit this to you, but I actually gave uh, I remember uh, yeah. you know, Mad Dog asking me, and I gave him some shit, you know. Uh, I think all you guys did, though. I think I, I think it's that's it's nobody's fault. You know what I mean? Everybody's responsible for their own what they do. You know. I forgive you. Thank you. <sighs> my brother w would be able to hang out with Razor Ramon, Jake the Snake, and all these guys because my brother was the guy with the pills. Now he never won a match in WWE history, not one. He was on TV 250 times. He lost 250 times. He was a jobber. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that they beat up. But he was the guy they beat up that had the pills. Yeah. So they kept, hey, hire Mike Bell. Hey, hire Mike Bell. I mean, back then, it was like an open forum. You know, do I blame wrestling for that? Like, I, no, I don't, I, I don't blame wrestling. I think it goes on in the NFL. I think it goes on in the UFC. Yeah. I think it goes on in baseball. I think it goes on in, in sports. I think it goes on in high schools. It goes on everywhere. My brother in, in Bigger, Stronger, Faster says, if I only would have made it, mm. everything would have changed. Right. How do you feel about that? I think that's a joke. My buddy Jeff knows about success. He got a scholarship to an Ivy League school and went on to play in the NFL. The grass is always greener. You know, if you can say, but if only, it's comfortable for people to do that. But you know, when you get to the other side of it and, and you have those material goods and you have the things you thought you wanted, and you know, those boxes are checked. That's when some real soul searching happens. Chris Lieben climbed the ranks of the UFC and achieved the fame and fortune that Mad Dog dreamed of. But the fight with his own demons proved to be more than he could handle. My motto was everything in excess, nothing in moderation. Go fast, kick ass, chug beers, crank tunes, you know, just fucking full speed ahead. I would drink and party and stuff, you know, when I first started with the UFC, and, and people would be like, oh my God, look, Chris Lieben's out drinking, and he's got a fight coming up, da-da-da. Well, I figured out that I could still take the edge off 
by taking a pill and nobody would know. And what I realized is, is it, it worked not only for my pain, but for me, for, for my anxiety and, and it mellowed me out. Where you're in a position of perceived power or class in the society, you can get whatever you want. People, it, the funniest thing for me was when I got to the NFL and I had more disposable income than I ever had in my life, everyone wanted to give me things. <laughs> it's is so backwards. Including drugs. Including drugs. I mean, I was a kid that, that, that didn't come from a lot, you know? Now I'm somebody, being, being somebody, I, I didn't ever feel like I, I was worthy to be somebody. Now all of a sudden, girls in particular, that I know weren't interested in me were starting to act like they were interested in me, and I'm going, hang on. They, they only want to be with me so that they can hang out with uh, the UFC fighter, Chris Lieben. I allowed those things to really drag me down into, into a pretty, pretty dark spot. And for me, um, pills were the way out of that dark spot. I'm the golden child. I'm an Ivy League educated NFL football player. And I'm a drug addict. I, would, I mean, I have my big calendar on my wall. And I'd be, okay, today I'm gonna take five pills. Five, 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 four, four, three, three. Now I switched to Percocet. I had it all written out. Jeez. I had a big plan, you know, on how I would get down, spend a few days on the bathroom floor, puking, da, da, da. Go in, perform, make my money so I could keep doing it. It got to the place where I was waking up on my couch, covered in piss, not knowing what time of day it was, what day it was. And when I would wake up covered in piss, I would just take more drugs and pass back out. Do you ever do anything like you're really embarrassed about when you're on pills? <sighs> Everything, my whole life, man. <laughs> I got sick when I fought Brian Stan. I told everybody it was sugar. Nobody, nobody knows this. I was backstage, diarrhea, vomiting between my legs, and they're calling Chris Lieben out to fight. Here you go, let's go, Chris, let's go. I stepped into the fucking cage like that. I see both sides of the issue. And on one side, I see that, you know, honestly, those painkillers enabled me to play for as long as I did because they they killed a pain that otherwise I couldn't even bend down to tie my shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but they also created a monster. I could tell you stories about guys that, in, in particular, you know, Oxycontin, that, that used to do heroin and quit doing heroin to take Oxycontin because it's better. I mean, and it feels the fucking same to me. It feels the same. and. And, 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 and look, if I can think about heroin, you think about how horrible and terrible of a drug it is and where you're gonna end up if you start that. Oxycontin feels exactly the fucking same, but it's not. It's wrapped up in a, in, a, in, a, in a little blue pill, comes in a bottle with a prescription label on it with your name on it, says take two of these, whatever, you know? So wait a second. The drugs that the doctors are giving us are the same as the drugs being sold on the streets? Well, if you look at the chemical makeup of opiates like codeine, oxycontin, vicodin, and morphine, they are all directly or synthetically derived from the unripe seed pods of the opium poppy. Guess what else is made from the opium poppy? Heroin. That's right, good old H. And it's not just the opiates that share a common source with their street brothers. Take Adderall and Ritalin, which are made from the same stuff as meth. So basically, those pills that you have your children popping are street legal meth. Man, Heisenberg could have saved himself a load of trouble if he just opened a pill mill. You're goddamn right. But hold on a second. Punky Brewster told me drugs are bad. Drugs are bad for you. Grow up. Illegal drugs are bad news. Don't mess with them. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. In 1971, then-president and huge Elvis fan, Richard Nixon began the war on drugs. Since then, the war on drugs has cost the U.S. over $1 trillion, and the prison population has risen over 700%. Sounds like we're winning. So I get it. Drugs are bad, and the people who use drugs are bad guys and criminals, like Tony Montana. But Mad Dog and his friends weren't even talking about illegal drugs. They were talking about legal drugs, prescription drugs, the kind you keep in your medicine cabinet. There may be a drug addict in your house, and you may be their supplier. Federal authorities call it an epidemic. When you think of drug addicts, you don't think of, like, a housewife with four kids. Mm -mm. No, but we're everywhere. <laughs> you know, everywhere. You know other people like you? Uh-huh. There's lots of us. Everyone's affected by this epidemic, like Betsy Degree. She's a housewife from Minnesota. 
When her daughter was prescribed Adderall, Betsy turned to the medicine cabinet to solve her troubles. I ended up, you know, taking one and then taking two and then taking all of them. And then, then I just started telling her that she didn't have ADHD and took it all from her. Yep, yep, I took it from my daughter. When my daughter did take it, and this is how I justified it, when she did take it, she might have been able to focus more in school, but it took the joy from her. So I kind of felt like I justified it, like, well, you know, it really isn't good for her. And every time I'd get it refilled, I'd say, I'm not gonna do it this time, you know? And uh, I always did. Everywhere I go, the story's still the same. Like my friend Colby from the gym, and he's just a kid. When I was 15, I shattered my femur bone in four places. Basically put me on opiates from that point, um, and then it just escalated with uh, dose strengths. You're, how old were you at this time? Start, started at 15. Um, do you think there's a problem with uh, kids in high school and stuff doing prescription drugs? Oh yeah, definitely. I think it's so accessible, and you're not really taught about it in D.A.R.E. or in, in all these other programs. You know, it's always about marijuana or it's about cocaine. This is crack. Well, we grew up in the generation of, like, just say no and drugs are bad. None of that ever sunk in? Nope. Nope, that never sunk in. All that did it's... was create shame for people who couldn't, <laughs> you know? This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? There's a stigma around it, too. That, that we made this choice to just be drug addicts. You know, anybody can get addicted to these. You know, it doesn't, you know, like I said, I was an innocent, you know, I'm not, not innocent, but I was 16 years old, you know? It wasn't like I was seeking, you know, opiates. Prescription drugs aren't just hurting the people taking them either. They're destroying families. Like my friend Dustin, his own addictions almost cost him his son. The stupidest thing I ever did eating Percocet was raise kids because there was lots of conversations that I should have had that I didn't have. My son was 16 years old, 2011, December 19th, and he got ran over by a car. Lots of things came to light, okay? He was high. I didn't realize he was doing it because I was high, okay? That moment in my life was a huge wake-up call. It was a spiritual awakening, nothing short of it, bro. Because I sat there in that hospital, and I was just like, this, you know what I mean? There's, I got, I, I, in a way, caused this to happen because I was okay with so many things. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You, all right? I learned it by watching you. Another factor is, like, I kind of came from a family of addicts, in a sense, too, which I also think is a very big thing with why it's so easy for teens to, to abuse pain medications because, you know, when we come from addicts, you know, um, that's kind of like the human condition is, is that we are kind of born to be addicted to things. Why do you think people in America are so easy to just pop a pill? Well, it's just because all of us do. I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, you, you follow the flock, man. No one ever said, well, you shouldn't do the prescription drugs that the doctor said you can take. That's just a scary situation all the way around. I mean, how many people are running around this planet hyped up on pain pills because their doctor told them they can be, mm -hmm. that are completely checked out mm -hmm. on autopilot? <laughs> raising children, running businesses, flying airplanes, you know what I mean? And you wouldn't even know it. Uh, would never know it, and it's okay because they have a hall pass. You know what I'm saying? They're not drinking whiskey. They're not doing illegal drugs. Their doctor said, here you go. Take these three times a day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and lots of people will start abusing them beyond that, but they got that little hall pass and that little pill bottle with their name on it, and they can take it anywhere and all the time. You can get pills anywhere. I never ran out of pills. Look, I would go to CVS with these prescriptions, Walgreens with these prescriptions, Rite Aid with these prescriptions, you know, a mom and pop's pharmacy with these prescriptions. You know what I mean? It was, you know, I was driving around all day getting pills filled. You know what I mean? I had one that was 78 doctors in the last 12 months. Really? 78 different physicians ordered controlled substances for this person. So they're just driving, I mean, they're putting on hundreds of miles a day going to clinics, you know, just the circle just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I got a bad knee right now. I know what it feels like every day. And I see them, you know, prancing in here like, you know, but they're on, but yet the doctor's ordered 240 oxycodone tablets for them. I mean, okay, you're, you're either really well pain managed or you have little or no pain and you're just getting a prescription. Well, I mean, you know, but I think the, the hydrocodone, Tylenol combinations, you know, whatever strength you want, all the different vitamin strengths. 
Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably the one that's the most. And then, and then the oxy, oxycodone, oxycontin. Just that whole group of medication prescribing. I mean, in my in my 25 years of practicing, has gone up dramatically. It's amazing how many. I mean, if we did a handful a day years ago, and now it's a handful an hour. When they stopped making the oxycontin in the crushable form, where you could uh, shoot it and snort it and smoke it. When they got rid of that, their OxyContin lost 80% of its revenue. 80%. So what does that tell you right there? It tells you that people are over-prescribing OxyContin and overusing it. By how much? By 80%. Thank you. This is Richard Tate. He runs Cliffside Malibu, one of the most successful rehab facilities in California. There could not be a more clear statistic. 80% of the people using that drug are using it in a way that it is not intended. So now the question is, is are 80% of the doctors in on it? So it's like Shakedown Street. You go see your doctor, you talk to him about the football game, about everything else that, that happened during the month you didn't see him except for your health. And he writes you the script and charges you $120 and you're on your way to Costco or Sam's Club. You have something called addictionologists or doctors. You don't even know. The average layperson doesn't even know. And what happens is they get literally about a thousand people at a time paying 500 bucks a pop to come in and fill out their prescriptions once a month. And the doctors keep them sick. Well, you do the math. A thousand times 500 is 500,000 bucks a month. That's six million bucks a year. These doctors are profiting by keeping you sick. I've got the answer right here, ladies and gentlemen, to everything that ails you. Now step right up. Despite taking an oath to preserve our health, these doctors seem to be more concerned with profit than healing. I think that there's a small number of bad actors that just have no conscience whatsoever. But some of these people just don't know better. They just don't have the education. I think a whole generation of doctors grew up really not recognizing how dangerous these drugs are. I can tell you that when I went to medical school, we had one lecture on pain. And in that one lecture, we were told, if a patient has pain and you give them an opiate, they will not get addicted. Totally wrong. And yet, that's what I learned when I became a doctor, and that's what a whole generation of doctors learned. It's a fine line, because I can't say what your pain is. Who am I to sit here and tell you, no, you don't? We're gonna go back and forth on that one. Then again, there and there, there's the rub. Should we do away with pain medicines? That's ridiculous. No, because it's very valuable to not have to suffer through pain. How do I know that your lumbar spine isn't out of whack and that's why you're always having this chronic pain? Yeah. And then what do we do about it? I mean, there, there. I, I think you're probably gonna find there aren't a lot of easy answers. They say the hardest part of addiction is admitting you have a problem. So maybe it's about time to come clean about my own addictions. You see, the truth was, Mad Dog wasn't the only Bell brother that was popping too many pills. It's my Dodge Durango. I've had this um, since 2006, I think. You can see here I had a little fender bender. This was from uh, Vicodin. I pulled into a spot. I wasn't paying attention because I was all out of my mind. And this is the worst over here. You see, like, the headlight will even come out. This whole dent right here, I was taking Klonopin, and I was taking uh, hydrocodone uh, at a lot of them, and Percocet. I fell asleep, and I smashed my car into three other cars. And then this is real fun when you, go, when you try to go on a date, and the date opens the door, and that's what she hears. Um, <laughs> Insurance doesn't like to pay for things when you're fucked up either. Like, it's hard to tell them, you know, hey, uh, I was on a bunch of prescription drugs and I went off the road. It's embarrassing, you know? It's, it, 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 I had a nice car. It was a brand new car. It was nice. And now it's a piece of shit. For me, I had the hip replacement surgery and they gave me, you know, a bunch of pills to get, to, to get better. And then it got to a point where, um, I probably didn't need them, but I was still in pain mm -hmm. because they did both hips at the same time. One hip failed, but they didn't know it. It just got to a point where, you know, I was spending probably like $500 a week on prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, like just buying them off of people on the street because I needed it because I was so, I, I got to the point where I was so highly addicted. 
how do I tell my parents that just lost their first son that, like, hey, I'm addicted to drugs and, like, I can't get off of them? You could have told me uh, because, to me, I wouldn't have thought, oh, here we just lost Mike, now we're going to lose Chris. Okay, there's a big difference in being addicted because you have pain and you're trying to overcome the pain. And uh, the difference uh, in Mike where he was, like, always trying to get high. But I think it starts with, like, it starts with pain and then it turns into, like, an addiction where you're, like, you sort of just like the feeling of being loopy. I didn't know that you, I'm so sorry that you had that trouble, but um, I'm not sure. But you guys it... are also the reason I, I stopped doing it. So you can't be sorry. Like well, in, no. in the back of my mind, I'm like, I gotta do this for my family. You know? Well, in reality, well, really you have to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And until you're ready in here, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna accomplish anything. When we were young, did you ever think that any of your kids would grow up and have a drug problem or become? a drug addict like Mike and I did. A drug addict, and I, I'm just, you know, I guess this is what what you call it now with, if you take prescrip prescription, I, I'm just looking at him differently yeah, as his dad. it's weird, I never, I never did, you know, illegal drugs. I kind of went and, I, I did prescription drugs illegally. When Mike died, I was like, sort of, you know, at first I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I need to get off these pills. Like, I need to stop living my life this way. I need to go back to what I was doing. And then I just got worse. I went to a doctor and said I couldn't focus. She didn't run any tests. She didn't, she didn't do anything. She just said, oh, okay, well, why don't you try Adderall? You know? And then that, that same doctor, you know, because I was coming off the opiates, had me on Suboxone, had me on Klonopin and um, Adderall. Because of all those effects, even prescribed me Viagra. I didn't need Viagra. But like since she prescribed Were you even I, dating anybody? Or uh, I mean it's not like you were married having No, I was I was dating somebody, yeah, at the time. Viagra was like, I'll take it because it's fun. Like I'll take it, you know, not because, you know, not because I need it. Let me just try this and see if it works, you know, and then if it works works on what? Um, whatever. Like, does it make you feel better? Does it give you pleasure? Does it get you high? Does it get you know, make you happy? Does it make you you know, not as sad, you know, just because a doctor gave it to me, you know, the doctor could be just, at, you know, sometimes the doctors are just as bad as the drug dealers in the street. That's why there's thugs on every level. It, it all comes down to money in the United States. You know, in this country, it, it all come, if you follow the money, you're gonna come to the, you know, the answer uh, to, to most of what the problems are. Well, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. The love of it, not having it. Right. Yeah. I like having it. I don't yeah. have the love of it. <laughs> the real story that needs to be told here is, you know, how these pharmaceutical companies, you know, they produce all these pills, you know what I mean? And they flood the market with them. Look, all those guys, the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors, the people selling it, they're all drug dealers. That's the bottom line. They're all drug dealers. It's all about money. That's all it is. Look, this whole world centers around money. You know what I mean? It takes money. And for Big Pharma, money is good. They're senior executives with pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline at a pep rally in Las Vegas for their sales team. There are people in this room who are going to make an ungodly sum of money. Who wants to be a millionaire? In the past 10 years, the 11 largest drug companies made $711 billion. $711 billion? If we were looking for a bad guy, sounds like we may have found our man. The pharmaceutical industry remains the most profitable business in the U.S. More success and financial gain for the companies will always remain possible as long as more Americans are encouraged to take drugs. Pharmaceuticals have always been around, from the apothecary of the Middle Ages to the snake oil salesman of the Wild West. How can I deny him? If he's willing to pay for it, he's gonna get it any price. There have always been sellers of potions and tinctures with the promise of miracle cures and remedies. And most of them were far from helpful. So to protect us from these scam artists and charlatans, we created agencies like the FDA and required pharmaceutical companies to work under strict regulations. But that cut into their ability to make drugs for profit. And that's not American. 
Those regulations were getting in the way of big business, and pharma needed a hero. Enter everyone's favorite president and big business poster child, Ronald Reagan. The only way to stop abusing them is to stop using them. While Nancy Reagan was waging her war on drugs, Ronnie and his administration were lifting a moratorium on advertising to consumers. You know, for freedom. Big Pharma was born. Drug companies were now ready to take on the American public, and Reagan had given them access to the big guns, direct-to-consumer marketing. And in 1997, everyone's favorite saxophone-wielding president, Bill Clinton, and his administration loosened up the regulations even further, making us one of only two countries in the entire world that think that advertising to consumers is a good idea. I mean, I have to say, this was the advertising and marketing coup of the century. You couldn't do that before. This is my friend, Dr. Gerber. In 1997, he became the first person in the United States to receive a PhD in homeopathy. I mean, the fact that you can, you can present a problem to an audience as big as a TV audience and say, ask your doctor if such and such is right for you. Wow, I'll ask my doctor. So I go to my doctor. Lo and behold, because the rep from the company was just there with a truckload of samples, he goes, well, gee, let's see. He opens up the drawer gives the person like a month's worth of samples, just they're free, and then there goes the prescription writing, and then that's it for forever. So I get it. You give them the first taste for free, and then they're hooked. We tried to talk to a bunch of people from various pharma companies, but they didn't seem to want anything to do with us. So I talked to Gwen Olson. She was a pharma rep for 15 years and wrote the book, Confessions of an RX Drug Pusher. I knew at some point that was what my job was. I was a drug pusher. I was just doing it legally and with the, you know, being condoned by society. And when people would say, you know, well, you sell drugs, and I would always say, oh, yes, ethical pharmaceuticals, as if. I've never seen a commercial for Oxycontin. I've never seen one for Vicodin, and... They don't need them. The drugs sell themselves. So why do they advertise the other type of drugs? Because they have to get the consumer to believe that they need them. Hey, Pete. Yeah, it's me, big brother. Put the remote down and listen. This intervention brought to you by Niaspan. So you cut back on the cheeseburgers and stopped using your exercise bike as a coat rack. That's it? You're done? I don't think so. If there was a panacea that came onto the market tomorrow, do you believe that they'd have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising on primetime TV for the rest of the world to know about it? It would be word of mouth. People would know about it in a heartbeat. Women who take Lipitor or the other statin drugs for cholesterol have approaching a 50% greater chance of developing diabetes, according to this study. Well, what about all these statin drugs? Like, they're, they're you know, saving people's lives. We need statin drugs. Statin drugs are one of the biggest, uh, I, I call it a big fat lie because that's what the cholesterol lie is. The sickest people I've ever seen in my 32 years of practice were people whose cholesterol was too low. Without enough cholesterol in your system, your immune system can't work properly. All of the long-term data on the statins show that you will die sooner if your cholesterol is lower, particularly if you're over 55, if you're female or male. There is no benefit to the drugs. I'm not saying that there aren't some individuals who should monitor their cholesterol because of the risk factor, correct? There are other means of lowering cholesterol besides taking the toxic drugs that the statins are. This is a very ingenious marketing plan. What is one of the major side effects of cholesterol-lowering drugs? Do you happen to know? Impotence. Impotence is one of the things that's complained about most frequently for men that are on cholesterol drugs. Well, guess what the same manufacturer's number two selling drug is that makes Lipitor? Viagra. Viagra, hey! Now we got a patient population that we can sell our next drug to. Every time I take something, I always feel weird. And then somebody will say, a doctor will say, well, for the weirdness you're feeling by taking something, take something else. And the next thing you know, I'm taking nine things. Okay, okay, you're gonna wind up like Anna Nicole Smith. Like there was a point in time when I had my hip surgery I just got so conditioned to like taking a pill that when the next thing came up, like, oh, these painkillers are causing me anxiety. So then I need the Xanax and then, you know, I can't sleep. So you need the Ambien right. and you can't focus. So you need the Adderall. And then like, I, I was, I had, had like probably 10 prescription bottles, you know, in my cabinet. That's causing this problem. So take this and that's causing this problem. So take this. And then before you know it, you do have 10 prescription bottles on your, because of one problem. 
why take it if you don't need it, you know? A lot of people have this misconception that the pharmaceutical industry is altruistic and they're philanthropists and that they're, you know, looking to heal the world. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. The pharmaceutical industry is, their, their vested interest is in making their stockholders money because the pharmaceutical industry isn't in the business of health and healing. It's in the business of disease management and symptoms maintenance. Big Pharma has a, has a economic incentive to classify things so that they can create pills for them, right? Do you know what restless leg syndrome was? I didn't. <laughs> either, either did I. I'm, I'm so sorry! That, you know, they're sitting there because they've drank six cups of coffee today and they've got all these re refined carbohydrates and sugars running through their body and they're looking down there going, yeah, that's what I've got, restless leg syndrome. Let me go get a prescription for that. And I mean, there the indoctrination goes right in. 75% of the time, statistics say that if they go in and request a drug, the doctor will give it to them because the doctor considers it his business and they are his customer. That's the problem with, with the advertising, the, the big pharma advertising campaign. What they tell you is, whatever your symptom is, we've got a pill for it, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's not the way the world works, okay? You actually have to be a human being and feel your feelings. If your brother dies, okay, you can expect to feel sad. Feeling your feelings is hard, but lucky for us, Big Pharma has a solution. Psych meds. Finally, we have the perfect pill that promises to take away all of our bad feelings and replace them with sunshine and little happy trees. With all these scenes of trees and green grass and convertible cars and pillow clouds in the sky, if life is like that when you're on the purple pill, give me some purple pills. In 2001, the first Zoloft ads hit the airwaves and we finally discovered that we were suffering from depression. America had a sickness and depression was its name. Suddenly, the market was flooded with a tsunami of new psych meds. Now, one in every 10 Americans are on antidepressants, including our dogs. You heard it right, Doggy Prozac, a beef-flavored version of the well-known human antidepressant. This little guy, this is Radar. He belongs to a friend of mine, Ryan, who goes to my brother's gym. Radar's been feeling a little down lately, so Ryan took him to the doctor. So I talked to the vet and she finally, um, she prescribed him Prozac. It's, a, it's like a doggy specific Prozac. It's little eight milligram tablets that come like flavored and smell like a treat. Have you, you ever taken any prescription drugs? Uh, I was on Zoloft for three months about six years ago at this point. And why'd you quit taking it? I just hated it. it turned me into a zombie. You don't fear that for your dog? I mean, I do like this, this was kind of like, a less I was on Prozac for three months, I fucking hated it but I'm gonna give it to the same shit to him. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. There's been a huge change in the nature of what people think of as being illnesses. Doctor and author David Healy is one of the most outspoken critics of antidepressants, especially SSRIs. Every disease can be oversold. One of the ones that's being oversold uh, at at the moment, even though it's a real illness, is bipolar disorder. It's a rare condition. It's become, in the last 10 or 15 years, 5,000 times more common than it was before. Ever since they were introduced first in the late 1950s, it's been recognized back then that antidepressants don't suit all people. If you're on an antidepressant that doesn't suit you, it can make you suicidal, and it can also make you homicidal. This can happen to you even if you're a healthy volunteer taking these pills. It's not something linked to the illness. It's a thing caused by the pill and the fact that the pill is the wrong pill for you. When drugs worked for tuberculosis, tuberculosis vanished. When drugs supposedly work for depression or bipolar disorder these days, the illness doesn't vanish, it gets incredibly more common. Where the right kind of treatment can help save a life and save a career and save a marriage, all too often it's a condition that doesn't need treatment and where 
treatment can cause you to lose your life and lose your marriage and lose your career. That's a billion dollar industry. Exactly, and they're not going to give it up easily because there's no medical scientific evidence required to diagnose someone to take a psychiatric drug. So it is the most lucrative, cooperative, collusive effort that there is between allopathic healers and psychiatry. We've been sold the idea that these things work, that if you put your kids on Ritalin, they'll do better at school. If you're at work and you're taking an antidepressant, you'll do better at work. It seems rational to take them. It's not that we're irrational. We're trying to be rational, and we've been sold a bag of goods. People think that because it's prescribed by a doctor, it's safe. Mm -hmm. And it's approved by the FDA, so it's safe. I mean, these, these, these are illusory impressions that the public has, mm -hmm. and it's not true. To get a drug approved, a company only has to submit two positive studies to the FDA, showing that their drugs work better than a placebo. Not better than another drug already on the market, just better than a fake pill. Then to make things easier on pharma, they get to pick and choose which studies they submit. Meaning they could have 48 studies that say a drug is terrible and causes half uh -oh. the people who take it to grow tails. Well, you did it again. Gee, what a mess. But as long as they produce two positive studies, the FDA approves the drugs and we get another bottle on our shelves. Very frequently companies would come and they'd throw down millions of dollars and say, run it until you get this result. And what happens to the other 48 bad studies? They get filed away with the Ark of the Covenant in that warehouse from Indiana Jones. The value in drugs these days depends on companies being able to hide the data and conjure up the idea that these drugs are worth more than they actually are. The research I do is comparative effectiveness in drugs has always been left to the uh, pharma companies to, to do. The federal government doesn't fund that. Now, there are a lot of consulting firms that will come in and do the same kind of research. I call, I call them sort of uh, results are us. You tell me what you want to know, and I'll manipulate the data to find it. When it comes to publication, a lot of times, you know, a, a negative result or an or a indifferent result isn't published. I guess you could call it publication bias. Even the journals, New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA, et cetera, they, they know, you're basically saying, well, we did a nice big study and this new drug, everybody thinks is wonderful, had no effect. But isn't that dangerous to the to people taking it? If they don't know the information? Under the influence of control trials, believing that's the best kind of evidence, doctors stopped listening to patients and looking at patients and going by what they saw right in front of their eyes. They looked away from the patient and looked at the scientific evidence instead. What they thought they were seeing were articles by reputable academics in the best journals in the field. But what they were actually looking at was ghost-written articles and that no one had any access to the underlying clinical trials behind these articles. So the companies could say whatever they want. I started to recognize that I wasn't getting the full picture the information was being presented to me through rose-colored glasses so that I would present it to physicians through rose-colored glasses. I was being encouraged to misinform people. And if I was misinforming doctors, that meant doctors were misinforming their patients. So there was no informed consent taking place in the medical arena. And a new report raises serious questions about the safety of prescription drugs in this country. More than ever, medications that are supposed to help people are instead making them sick and in some cases even killing them. Anybody who has an, a guaranteed insurance reimbursement will be a victim of these things. Three out of 10 older people are taking at least five prescription drugs multiple times a day. Now, I asked our expert why this is happening. Tonight, I'm told they just don't know any better. I don't care if you're a foster child, if you are an elderly person that has Medicare, if you're an indigent person that has Medicaid. Older people who take a group of drugs used to treat conditions including asthma, depression, and epilepsy may have an increased risk of dementia and even death. If you are someone that they can be guaranteed that has a government job that you're gonna get reimbursement, you're gonna get put on one of these drugs because that means a refill every month 
and that is a compliant patient and they're going to get more money in the till down the road. Those are the patients Pharma loves. And if they can get your kids, wow, then they've got a lifelong customer. <laughs> Mom, I'm on an allergy medicine that won't make me drowsy. Children's Claritin chewables? Your child may be taking what is called the most abused drug in America and you may be completely unaware of how dangerous it can be. It's true Adderall has been named as the most abused and overused legal drug. Adderall has become the new gateway drug for kids. According to the DEA, 6,000 kids a day use prescription drugs to get high for the very first time. And it's killing them too. The district attorney's office has opened a child death investigation after a child overdosed on prescription drugs early this morning. And tomorrow, a summit will be held to talk about the growing problem of babies born to addicted prescription drugs. Many of those who are affected aren't taking pills to get high, but to get better following a doctor's orders and accidentally developing an unshakable addiction. It's the worst epidemic we face in America today. Addiction? prescription drug addiction, okay? I mean, we have- Is it bigger than alcohol? Way bigger. Every 19 minutes, someone dies in this country of an accidental overdose. Every 19 minutes. That means that you take a couple pills before you go to bed, thinking you're gonna get your daughter to school in the morning, and, and you just don't wake up. The deeper you dig, the worse these guys look. Recent publications have revealed safety problems with the drug Vioxx. With billions being made and not much to lose, critics say even in the case of crime, for this industry, nothing is likely to change. Unless people go to jail, unless the fines are much larger than they have been, the companies will find that it's cheaper to cheat. In a combination civil and criminal settlement, Pfizer has agreed to pay $2.3 billion the largest health care fraud settlement in the history of the Department of Justice. But at the same time, the company made, I believe, $8 billion in profit last year. What, what some industry uh, folks are skeptical about is that this isn't anything more than just the cost of doing business for a lot of these drug companies. Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Hold on, Mike. So hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus. They yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. You know, these guys are no joke. They're printing money, they know what they're doing, and uh, uh, they're great at it. And if they can condition a public, a, an entire culture, to something that's not true, they're saving a lot of money, you know? And it doesn't help anybody. It's killing a lot of people. My niece was, um, she was attending Indiana University. She was a pre-med student and she was in a car accident. And so they started her on mood stabilizers and antipsychotics and antidepressants. And by the time it was over with, she was on 14 different drugs. She had to drop out of school. She wasn't able to work. She cold turkeyed off of her drugs trying to recuperate. And that is an absolute no-no. I mean, you never, ever, ever want to stop taking a psychiatric drug, cold turkey, because you will go into an absolute tailspin. So out of desperation, she walked into her younger sister's room, took an angel-shaped oil lantern out of that room and poured the oil over herself, and she ignited it, and she burned herself alive. And once I had done my my due diligence and my research on it, and I realized that the information had been there that these drugs caused suicidal ideation from the get-go, and that it had been covered up by the pharmaceutical industry and by the FDA, that I got angry. I spoke out when they murdered my niece, and that's what happened to my niece. They murdered your brother, they murdered my niece, because they knew that these things existed, and they knew that there were people that were vulnerable that would be taking them, and they did not inform us. The onus is on them. People ask me all the time, oh, aren't you afraid the pharmaceutical industry is gonna kill you? Hell no, I'm afraid they're gonna kill you and you and you and everybody I know and everybody I love and I'm still gonna be sitting here screaming at the top of my lungs. That's what I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. So whatever that anybody can do to add their voice to this choir, it's a moral obligation. So was Gwen right? Had Pharma really killed her niece? Had they killed my brother? This is Greg Kreitzer. 
He's a journalist who wrote one of the top books on America's relationship to pharmaceuticals called Generation Rx. It seems like we have this like culture of addiction, right? And we have big pharma who's obviously they're making these drugs because there's a demand for them. They're also creating a demand. There's, um, there's doctors who are pushing the drugs and, and you have good doctors and bad doctors. You have good drugs and bad drugs. You have, you know, who is the bad guys and the good guys in all this? Or is there any, or are they just thugs on different levels, you know? Yeah, I mean, as a journalist, I'm always looking for bad guys. Um, and, you know, I, I did my book about uh, prescription drugs. Um, and some people said, you know, oh, you know, uh, Kreitzer really let them off the, off the hook. You know, he didn't condemn them. And my, my feeling was, I'm just going to show, show you what they do. You decide if it's bad or not. We Americans are pretty quick to string up a bad guy, from the commies of the Cold War to the jihadists in the War on Terror. It feels good to point the finger at someone, and you can't really ask for a more deserving bunch of guys than Big Pharma. But easy bad guys are just lazy writing. Nothing ruins a film like an easy bad guy. What about all the good pharma has done? Modern medicine has beaten diseases that have ravaged mankind and killed millions over the century. Chickenpox, diphtheria, malaria, measles, polio, HIV, all but eradicated by pharmaceuticals, and that's just in the past century. So maybe pharma is not actually the disease, but just another symptom of America's culture of addiction. I think, you know, one of the big problems is culture, like you're talking about. I mean, uh, I don't necessarily call it an addiction culture. I call it a fix things quickly culture. Why do you think it's so easy for people just to go for the, the quick, easy fix? Well, I mean, going for the quick, easy fix is human. I mean, we want to minimize our, our expenditure of calories. It's, it's very fundamental. That's always going to be there. The question is, why does the system accommodate it? And I think that's, uh, that's pure free market capitalism. Takes one to know one, as they say. Maybe the reason pharma is so good at preying on our addictive natures is that they're addicts too. And what's their addiction? Profit. Drug companies used to think of themselves as medical science companies. They were often led by a scientist or a, a physician. If you could get 10% profit a year, that'd be great. We could roll out one new drug a year, great. If you look at the records of the congressional hearings in 1983 on prescription drug advertising, um, you, there's all these letters, and these letters that go on and on about what an awful idea this is, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they're all from the presidents of the major pharmaceutical companies. Um, so, so those guys changed, you know? The next generation were not doctors. They were people who were interested in 15%. I want AIDS in the Boy Scout magazine and every college paper, full page ads in color. <laughs> it seems like the pharma companies are just like addicted to money. I mean, it, they're, they're like addicts in themselves in a way. That's not news. That's not news. That's what they do, right? I mean, they're in it to win it. I mean, you go to a barber, you're gonna get a haircut. You go to a, hmm. a bar, you're gonna get a drink. I like to think of um, drug companies as, as motion picture makers. They've decided, I got this movie, I'm gonna show you guys. I'm gonna show it to you so often that you're gonna internalize it. And at some point, if you get one of these afflictions, you're gonna say, hmm, I'm, let me, I'm gonna try that. I think when you create a culture in which default, when, in which the default is the pill and not other things that might make you better, um, then you end up with addiction. The origin of the word for pharmaceutical is pharmakon, P-H-A-R-M-A-K-O-N, it's Greek. And it has two meanings. One meaning is cure and the other meaning is poison. It was a, it's a very insightful word because if you think about it, almost all medicine is poison. It's something that's foreign to our body that one part of our body or another is going to have to react to as like a, an invading, you know, force. Um, now, sometimes it, it reacts a good way and we get better, but there's always a, there's a price for the poison is what I like to say. So, you know, in America we have, you know, we say we have a war on drugs, right? Yeah. But we have... War on drugs? No, man. No. Uh, fuck, man. It's a war on money. It's who can get the most amount of money. You know what I mean? I made my money in a lot of wrong ways back in the day, too. You know what I mean? Everybody's on the take. Yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. I would be, you know? Yeah. But why is nobody stopping it? 
Why is nobody stopping a like machine the, that the prints government. money? Yeah, the government. I don't want to answer that. You know <laughs> the answer to that. Everybody who's watching this knows the answer to that. Why, do, why does big oil get government subsidies? Because they sponsor campaigns. Okay, why does Big Pharma allow to continue to make money? Because they're one of the most powerful lobbying interests in the world. I think we're at a point where the United States and Europe and most major companies need to ask themselves whether the healthcare e economy is sustainable with these companies in it. And I think the way they're operating, it's not. This is, this is where we need some political leadership. But finding political leadership might prove to be harder than you think. In 2013, Big Pharma spent close to $226 million on lobbying our government with an army of 1,445 lobbyists. Congress only has 535 members. So that means Pharma spent upwards of $422,000 per congressman, making sure the US government knew exactly what Pharma wanted. That's a lot of influence. And in 1992, Congress passed the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, which allows pharma companies to pay a fast-track fee to the FDA of up to $350,000 per drug to speed up the approval process. Like the Fast Pass line at Disneyland, their drugs get bumped to the front of the line, and the result? More drugs hitting the market, and pharma's profits exploded. If success is measured by return on the dollar, the pharmaceutical industry made a killing. Maybe Horseshoe was right. Maybe everybody is on the take. They say if you have a problem in America, you can visit your local congressman. I tried it in my last film. Maybe it'll work better this time. This is California Congressman Ted Lieu. In a state with one of the highest rates of opiate addiction and overdoses in the country, Congressman Liu, unlike a lot of other politicians, is actually trying to do something about it. For a long time, we've had a war on illegal drugs. Uh, these are legal drugs that are killing far more people. And we need to have systems in place where we can identify someone that may be abusing uh, these painkillers. The Cure system, for example, is a database that would let pharmacies and doctors know if a patient is going to multiple pharmacies or multiple doctors trying to get the same prescription medication. Is there any sort of uh, motion to make the Cures program or a program like it national? So it would be great if there was a national fully funded program. As you know, it's been difficult to get things through Congress these mm -hmm. days. So I don't have high hopes <laughs> for that. So yeah. the individual states, I believe, will have to pick up the slack. What's your feeling on like the medical marijuana stuff? Well, well people are not dying from medical marijuana. Uh, they are dying from legal prescription drugs, uh, especially these powerful painkillers. I had a question for you because I, I think this is pretty crazy. It's like, you can just go on Craigslist, right? And you can type in like Oxycontin, Xanax, whatever you want. And it's, and you can just pull it up and get it. And they've, you know, they've done stuff like outlawed escorts on Craigslist. Right. But, um, but they haven't done anything about the prescription drugs. How, how do we get, people like that to cooperate. So I did not know that until you told me. So let me ask you this. When you put that in a Craigslist, is it a doctor that issues a prescription? Or no. do you just get something no, mailed to your some, home? some dude, you know? And they just get it brought well, you to you and mailed to you. You go meet some shady guy in, you know, some shady part of town. And you have, you know, pink delivery only, $10. And then you click on it. Minimum 10 must have address, discreet delivery, must have callback number, limited amount. Send email to firewooddelivered at gmail.com. Wait for call back or text tone. That's illegal. So they could just stop this. If they well, they, they, could, they could put in these put in these words and say, we don't, anything with this word will be removed. I got it. I mean, it could be that simple, right? I mean, it's like. Yeah, that's crazy. Thank you. Look at Suboxone. Oh my goodness. Hey, I have a little more than 10. Only want to, only want to sell all at once. That's just illegal. That's amazing. Okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> no, thanks for showing that to me. Thanks. Great. Cool. Senator Lou's holding a press conference to um, have Craigslist stop uh, letting people advertise prescription drugs on their website, and this is all because of this film, which is kind of crazy. It's interesting that you can make a movie and actually 
affect a change in people and affect, you know, things that happen every day and maybe um, save some lives along the way. Um, if not, then I just ratted out all these people's drug hookups and they'll probably hate me. But I, I wasn't the guy that shut down the prostitutes, if anybody out there is wondering. If you're on Craigslist selling dope, we're going to put you in jail. And that's my message to you. Senator Lou. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assistant Sheriff Pentis. More people die from prescription painkillers than cocaine and heroin combined. And Craigslist is helping facilitate this. That's why last month, Nevada State Senator Segublom and I sent a letter to Craigslist asking them to take down these ads. To date, they have not. We're calling again for Craigslist to immediately ban these ads the same way that Craigslist did so with prostitution ads. Uh, this is a huge problem. It's time for Craigslist to do the responsible thing, which is ban these ads. The whole reason why I knew about buying drugs on Craigslist is because I've done it. You know, I, I'm not happy to say that I've done it, but I, I've done it. And I think that that's the only way you can sort of affect change is to go out and, you know, be honest with people and tell them what, what you did. And, um, I was addicted to pills because I had a hip problem, but it's no different from somebody who gets addicted because they like to, to be high. My brother died, and a big reason why he's not here is prescription drugs. And until you see that happen, until you see people go down that path, you know, people think it's a joke, but it's not a joke. It's, it's serious. Get out of here. <laughs> Uh, I first learned about Chris's uh, uh, addiction and stuff like that from his friend Leland, who called me a couple times. Um, it, and it was kind of strange because I'd get a phone call and he'd be like, hey man, you know, your brother's having some issues. And, uh, you know, I think maybe it's developing into a problem, you know. And then, and then, he, then we'd communicate again a few months later and I'd be like, how's Chris doing, you know? Because he'd always give me a straight up answer. And he's like, you know, he seems like he's refocused, like, seems like things are good. Uh, things are moving forward with his, with his movie and with his career and stuff, and looks like it's good. And then I get another call a few months later again, like, hey, you know, it looks like you know, things aren't going so good and stuff like that. And then finally it kind of uh, climaxed to a point where his uh, girlfriend, um, she called me one day, and it was, it was kind of scary. I mean, first of all, you know, it was, it was a phone number that, you know, I don't really ever pick up my phone. I, like, never answer my phone. But I just had a sense that, like, there was just something, something was off, you know, something was... I just had a sense that something uh, may be wrong. And so I answered it, and uh, it was his girlfriend, and she was just, she couldn't talk. I didn't even understand who it was. I was just like, you know, who the hell? And then she's like, it's Lauren. And I'm like, what, Lauren? I'm like, oh, it's okay. Chris's girlfriend, you know? And then she's, uh, she was very, you know, very, very upset, but hysterical. And then so I was just trying to calm her down and get a sense of what the hell was going on. And she said that she was outside his apartment and she was scared to go in because she was scared what she would find. You know, she, she didn't know if he, if, she didn't know how messed up he would be. She didn't know if he'd be dead, laying on the floor dead. Luckily, she didn't find me dead, but I wasn't too far from it. The truth was, even making this film, I had been lying to everyone. My addiction to pills hadn't actually ended after my hip surgery. I traded pills for alcohol, which led me right back to the pills. My family rallied the troops, and the next thing I knew, I was back with Richard Tate at Cliffside Malibu, but this time as a patient. After 60 days of rehab, I finally got to come home. I needed to go to rehab, so like, whatever I did, whether it was subconscious, it definitely wasn't consciously. Oh, no. It was subconsciously. Whatever I did subconsciously was um, was like some sort of weird cry for help because I didn't know how to say it. You know, I knew I had a problem yeah, still, I and I couldn't. Like, I was like, well, we're like also, also like, yeah, I I went out and I raised the money for this movie and I got funded on this movie, and they're like, okay, here, go ahead, go make your movie. What I'm gonna do, turn around and be like, well, here's the problem with the movie. I'm actually a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I can't admit it to you, so, like, let's not make the movie. I was already, like, wheels in motion, and I'm like, 
you know, when they said, okay, you, you won, you got the money, I'm like, shit, now I got the money, now I actually have to do it. With you, you know, I know, you know, if I, if I get phone calls a lot and you're excited, I know that you're doing good. But it's when you don't want to talk, when I know you're not doing good. And I don't want to make that phone call. You kind of play these things out and you're just going to be like, oh, he's just going to tell me to fuck off. You know, and, and I don't know why. But I, I wouldn't do that. I respect you probably more than anybody. You, you'd be the only person I'd listen to. <laughs> yeah. The only one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough. Like I said, you know, I'm starting to welt up right now yeah. over it. There's so much that I've lied about. Mm -hmm. There's so much that um, that I feel sorry, you know, like feel bad for. Even like during the course of this movie, I'm a liar. You know, in the, in the middle of the movie, I go to the state capitol and I talk to the senator. And I say to him, uh, you know, you can buy these drugs on Craigslist. And he said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, I used to do it years ago. I was doing it while I was making the movie. Right. I was on the phone calling people on Craigslist buying Xanax. If you're an addict, you don't have a choice, okay? You don't have control over it. It's got control over you. What this is, is, is it's a behavioral disorder. You habituate. You, you, you do over and over and over again certain actions and you create a neural pathway in your brain, okay? And that's the action that you're more likely to repeat. Anytime you're out of balance with anything at its most simplest level, it's a behavior that you wanna change and you have to replace it with a behavior that is more mindful and balanced. So you change that behavior that's causing you wreckage or grief in some way, and you replace it with the behavior that serves you. The problem with people is that they don't want to take responsibility. They want to blame someone else. The pharmaceutical industry isn't doing to the, this to us if we don't allow it to be done. Mm -hmm. There's something called consumer demand. If there was no consumer demand, they would stop pushing the things down our throats. So people have to be proactive and they have to start self-educating and be their own health advocate. If you don't speak up for you, no one is going to speak up for you. This is Kat Taylor. She's a child psychologist specializing in families dealing with addiction. Why, why do you think addiction is such a big problem in America? A culture trains us to avoid bad things. And I work with a lot of children and I ask them to identify a time they felt sad. And I have a lot of children that will not identify a time they feel sad because we're not supposed to be sad. We get these messages in our media and in our culture that everything's supposed to be great. Any, anybody could just go to Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Everything looks wonderful on Facebook, right? We're all launching our own little campaigns about how great our lives are. and. We want to have the white picket fence and we want to have that American dream and it's just going to be, everything's going to be great. So this abject denial of anything negative um, leads us to feel very uncomfortable. But a lot of times those feelings are normal. Negative feelings are normal. Sad feelings are normal. It's part of life. We have to accept it. As I was going through the footage of this film, I came across an interview my father did with my brother right before he died. That seems to get to the heart of the matter. So what's your plan? What do you think you're going to do? Yeah, what I need to do is uh, all the energy that, and time and money that I waste and spend on self-destructing, I need to spend on self-improving. The biggest thing that you said is that you don't want to be an average Joe. And um, my point is there's nothing wrong with being an average Joe, because average Joe is the guy who uh, fights for his country. You know, he, he doesn't know how to do it, but he gets to Normandy on the beach and he decides, I'm gonna step up and get this done. That's average Joe. He steps up to the plate and takes care of the problem, whatever the problem is, you know? Like, I don't really feel like there's any problem with being an average Joe, but you do. You think that, you think, I think you think that you need to be or you wanna be a superstar of some kind. Well, I, uh, I thought I was over that and, and apparently I'm not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Well, but that's the thing though, I don't think that would make you happy even if you were. You can't go on to be a superstar, a super personality, a super anything, until you step up to the plate and manage your own problem. Mm -hmm. You could go on and be great and happy. You could end up dead yeah. doing what you're doing. Um, and that's not what I want for you. Okay. 
and I'm here because I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help you. I love you. I don't know what else to say at this point. <laughs> Me neither, but I think we should talk again before they leave, though. <laughs> love you. Love you. Uh, thanks for coming out. Yeah, I can't get up anymore. <laughs> at the beginning of this movie, I said my heroes were dying. But maybe I just chose the wrong heroes. Maybe the real heroes are the average Joes. People like my father. Maybe if Mad Dog and I were satisfied with what we had, instead of feeling like the grass is always greener, we wouldn't have turned to something outside of ourselves for our happiness. In, in a much bigger thing, like this movie is not really about just like prescription drugs, it's like about addiction. It's about like, right. why do we get hooked on shit? Why are we so, e it's so easy to just be like, I need my Starbucks every day, I need this every day, I need that every day. When we are sort of at our limit of how many addictions we can have, something new comes out, <laughs> you know what I mean? If there's anything I've learned over the course of making this film, America is a nation of addicts. We live in a quick fix consumer culture where the good life is just a purchase away. Whether it's a new car, a new iPhone, or a new pill, all of your problems can be solved with this amazing new product. And that is something that Big Pharma has exploited incredibly well and to disastrous effect. We are constantly bombarded by images of unattainable lifestyles inhabited by always smiling people who seem to have no problems. But the real world is full of problems and we're never told what to do with the emptiness that leaves behind. I am on a lot of prescription pills though. Oh, is that a story? No, it's an addiction. He's being hooked on video games, a medical condition. Startling new insight into the addictive power of sugary, salty, and fatty foods. Would you coffee addiction is real, and Americans drink more coffee than anyone else. We've been reporting on internet addictions, on a mom who spent 50 hours a week playing online games, and a dad who became obsessed with internet porn sites. Somewhere along the way, we traded doing the hard thing for doing the easy thing and it hasn't suited us well. In our push to become the greatest country in the world, we have lost sight of what made us that way in the first place. It's time for America to detox. We need to examine why we are so quick to eat that cheeseburger, drink that coffee, or take those pills. Do we really need it? Or are we just feeding the addict that hides in us all? Mr. Dear pharmacist, won't you please give me some energy?